honeybees, not the honeys of the bee world. So the European honeybee Apis mellifera is the bee that gets all the media attention, gets unfortunately most of the funding. Um, and even in Australia, um, so many people still think that Apis mellifera is um, an Australian bee. And when they see colonies of feral honeybees, um, so like feral cats, um, they, they think that they're uh, wild native bees where it's really not the case. And Australia has one of the world's leading extinctions in mammals. And part of that is due to introduced species. We might also have an issue with introduced species in terms of the introduced European honeybee on Australian native bees, but it's been very little studied, but there's lots of opinions flying around. So I decided to do quite a controversial um, research topic. So honeybees, they could compete with our Australian native bees and um, competition can be either physical competition where um, one species physically excludes other bees from foraging or resource competition. So when there's shared flow preferences and those flowers are um, in limited supply, the more successful competitor, um, the one that's better at finding and harvesting resources could deplete those resources and there's not enough to sustain the populations of the inferior competitor, um, which can then have impacts on fitness, lead to population declines and ultimately potentially extinction. Uh, now, honeybees might not only impact native bee populations, but they could also impact the structure and function of plant pollinator networks. So that is what I looked at. Um, for over two years, I surveyed 14 urbanised regions in the Southwest Western Australian Biodiversity Hotspot. And I looked at bushland, sorry, bushland remnants, as well as gardens, recording the number of honeybees, native bees, and the plants that they visited. So I wanted to look how honeybees affect pollination networks and whether honeybees are competing with our Australian native bees. Now this research is published, so I've only got a very um, short amount of time to talk about it, but if you wanna read more, those are my two um, articles. And if you can't access them because I couldn't pay the open access fees, um, I can send you a sneaky copy. So yeah. <laughs> so the first one, I looked at how honeybees impact pollination networks. Now I found that Honeybees dominated the networks. So honeybees are the red bars there, and that's just numbers. Those are the um, examples of the bushland remnants, residential gardens, um, over the two years. And you can see this single species made up um, the majority of individuals. And this was especially the case in the residential gardens. Um, just a little thing. Um, in Australia, we call uh, natural vegetation, natural landscapes, bush like the bush. Um, so bushland is natural vegetation landscapes. Uh, so yeah, honeybees were um, dominating those interactions. Now, they also were different to the native bee taxa. Um, so they didn't occupy equivalent roles. They are not ecological replacements. Um, they had, they visited more plant species, um, they had greater species strength, and these are all indices calculated from bipartite networks. Um, they also were less reliant on the plants um, compared with the native bees, whereas the plants were more reliant on the honeybees um, than vice versa. So um, that's largely because they visited so many different plants. Um, honeybees were also had a lot more variability in their interactions with the plants than the native bees. Um, they had a higher pollination surface index. This is a, an index, so it's not actually measuring pollination, but it's a proxy for it. Um, and they also had a much right, wider range of specialization than the native bees in these networks. Now, the really um, sort of astounding thing was that they also impacted network properties, the entire network structure. Um, so the more honeybees there were, there were significant relationships between a number of um, network properties um, and bees all related to um, basically they made the networks more unstable. Um, they also resulted in more competition. So native bees, they had to forage on different resources 
to reduce the impact of co um, competition. They made networks more generalised and also there was a higher niche overlap because of their competitive impacts. Um, so they impact pollination network structure. How do they impact the native bee populations? So when I first looked at just overall abundance, I found no associations. Um, and in terms of species richness, it varied between the two years. Um, so first year, significant positive, second year, significant negative relationships. So this firstly indicates that um, the associations are going to vary according to abundance versus species richness, so what metric you use, and also going to vary by year. But also this is a really coarse approach. So, you know, thinking ecologically, honeybees aren't going to impact every single species um, because, you know, resource competition is about when there's resource overlap. So if the species don't overlap in resource use, then they might not be affected. And different species have different ecologies, which can impact um, competition but also competition might vary by plant resources now the standard idea is that if you have more flowers it's going to reduce competition and then I found this really striking unexpected relationship where I found that when there were more flowers and more flower species this actually exacerbated the negative impact of honeybees on, on native bees so when there were more flowers that's when there were negative associations and at first this seems like completely counterintuitive and I was like did I do something wrong but I didn't um, what when I looked at my data it's because um, honeybees are super generalists our Australian native bees many of them are very specialized and so they will only forage on plants in a single family when you're looking at urban urban areas and especially residential gardens the majority of plants there are exotic so they benefit honeybees and um, they they basically um, give honeybees a competitive edge. So there's, um, you know, in, in these floral diverse gardens, there's actually very few of the native flora that the native bees need, um, but there's plenty of what the honeybees need. So we have to really think about the nuances and what flowers we're looking at. So these very like coarse approaches of just overall flowers, overall bee abundance um, might give us a very misleading picture. Um, so, Competition can also vary by, by ecological traits. So I looked at how body size influenced competition. Found smaller bees positively associated with honeybees. Doesn't mean they're benefiting from honeybees, but they're both responding positively or negatively to the same things. But I found that um, the larger body bees, they were negatively affected by honeybees. This makes, again, ecological sense. Bigger bees have larger energy requirements. So they're the ones that are gonna suffer from um, resource competition. Uh, I then I looked at how resource overlap, which I measured through bi bipartite networks through potential for apparent competition, influenced um, these relationships. And I found that when um, there was higher uh, resource overlap, the, the bee tax that had, had higher resource overlap with honey honeybees were at lower abundances. So um, again, um, this is, is showing that when you look at the, you know, the actual metrics of resource competition, the native bees that are suffering from um, resource overlap are having um, impacts on their abundances. Now, I also found um, that it varied by the particular bee taxon. Um, the ones that were most vulnerable uh, were the Hylaean bees. Many of these are Matasi specialists. They're small to medium-sized bees. Um, and then the ones that were least vulnerable were Amygdala. So these are general species as well. Um, they can forage on a wide range of, of flora. So that means that they're um, not as constrained by foraging on a single resource and less likely to suffer from competition, as well as our mega chili bees. Many of these um, have a strong preference or are specialised on Fabaceae. These flowers have a keeled structure. Um, they're more complex to forage on. They require a bit more effort. And I've noticed honeybees, they prefer um, sort of easy access flowers. Um, so that's a sort of like um, a, a refuge from competition by foraging on these. Now, competition in terms of potential for apparent competition also varied by habitat type. So it was much higher in the residential gardens. 
And again, this is um, because of the flowers that, that are there. In residential gardens, there's more plant species, but there's a lower proportion of the native flora that the native bees need and more of the diverse flora that honeybees um, prefer. So um, com competition, again, is um, exacerbated in more urbanised habitat types. So what can we do about this? You know, I found that the, you know, honeybees weren't devastating all native bees, but there certainly were um, indications that they were having negative impacts. Now, uh, feral honeybee colonies are, a oops, big issue. So we should um, eradicate them. Um, they have other impacts on the Australian environment because they take up hollows and trees that our parrots and our possums need to nest in. Limit backyard beekeeper density. So there's this big movement that oh, to save the bees, everyone should become a backyard beekeeper. That's a terrible idea. The density of honeybees is like really high in urban areas in um, southwest Western Australia. Many people, the backyard beekeepers, they go into it without um, doing courses. They like will be like, oh, my bees are like not there anymore what happened and they don't even realize they swarmed so um yeah leave the beekeeping to people that are experts in beekeeping um, we do need beekeepers for crop pollination services in australia um, and honey in australia but um yeah having a, a bee hive in your backyard is not a very good idea for the environment mandatory swarm prevention courses plant more flowers that native bees prefer so resource competition is about um, overlap and limiting resources. So if resources aren't limiting, then they can coexist. So plant lots of native flora. Um, and raise awareness about our native bees. Um, you know, the, we don't need to save an introduced invasive species. They are a domesticated species or a feral species. Um, they have a role in um, the economy, but not in the environment. And we really need to raise the profile and raise awareness about our native bees and um, evidence-based approaches to conserve them. So thank you so much for um, letting me present my, my research on this very controversial topic at um, BeeCon. And yeah, I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions. All right, thank you so much, Kit, that was great. Um, I think this is a topic that a lot of people are really getting into right now. Um, so yeah, if there are any questions, if you'd like to just uh, put a hand up and then we can unmute you or pop it in the question and answer box and I can read it out. Um, maybe just to start, I'll ask Kit, if you could maybe do anything differently with your research or maybe next steps, is there anything that you can say on that? Oh, there's like so much um, future research that can be done. So one, um, like this was part of my thesis and then I had a whole other part on um, bee hotels and um, see these, what I was measuring was, you know, um, foraging associations and, um, you know, network structure. But um, I wanted to also look at how honeybees impacted fitness. So I put up bee hotels and um, measured the impact on um, offspring reproduction, offspring size, and also looked at the pollen inside the nest for resource overlap. Unfortunately, I didn't even get to put that into my thesis. It's one of about 20 half finished papers that like, I really, really need to finish and I just don't have the time or funding at the moment, but it's killing me. And especially because this is like, this is like the nail in the coffin, like fitness impacts. Um, also an experimental approach. So I did two experimental approaches and they didn't go so well because this is ecology and it's messy. So the first one was I wanted to eradicate honeybee hives. Firstly, trying to find honeybee hives, um, feral honey col honeybee colonies in the environment is quite tricky. Um, I would love to like train sniffer dogs to find trees with feral colonies but even when you find them then uh, if they're really high up a tree um, it's very hard to remove them um, and also um, finding um, like councils that are willing to remove them and also do it in a safe way because like there's no way I want to like harm other insects when trying to remove the honeybee colonies so an experimental approach 
um, eradicating um, feral honeybee colonies before after control impact. I tried to do that, but I didn't really have very high replication. So I found some patterns, and again, this is like a half-finished paper that might never see the light of day, but I really hope it does, because <laughs> especially because it's um, suggestive but not really um, enough statistical power. And then doing um, experiments in, like, controlled cages, which I tried as well. Um, I, I went in every single day for two months and the bees just flew against the roof most of the time. It was so disappointing, but that would be another, like um, I've been reading papers and I don't know what's the, like there's the, the sort of way to ensure that they forage naturally encaged environment. Um, there's been some amazing research with the, with some Osmia bees and honeybees in um, controlled cages. Um, I don't know like if anyone has any ideas about how to not have the bees just fly against the roof the whole time. That would be great. <laughs> but yeah, that's yeah. great. You know, things don't always go as we, we plan and we can't always get everything done that we want, but hopefully you can continue with things that you would like to. Um, yeah. We do have one, one question, maybe a time for one more quickly here uh, from Barbara Keating. She asked, how is it possible to limit beekeeper numbers? How will the reduction be enforced slash encouraged? Yeah, so um, I guess, firstly, um, making people aware about native bees because they still there's so many people that think there's there's just honeybees and that honeybees are going to go extinct. There's like this big media narrative. So if if people I think are more educated that hey, there's native bees and you can encourage them to your gardens by having um, you know well designed bee hotels, not shitty bee hotels. Uh, sorry, that's not very academic, but yeah. <laughs> Uh, bad bee hotels, um, planting the right flowers. You can have the native bees and like the honeybees, they are, you know, they are dangerous animals. More people die in Australia from honeybee stings than sharks and snakes and all the other like dangerous, deadly stuff in Australia. So, um, you know, making people aware that we have the native bees. Also there, there should be some sort of regulations. It's like, um, you know, you, you have, in, in urban areas with domestic species, you have regulations on, you have to, re in Australia anyway, you have to register your dog and cat. You have a limit of how many dogs and cats you can have. Um, it's crazy that that's, there's no regulations in, in many um, suburbs um, for honeybees. So having, you know, we already do it with other domesticated species, I don't think it would be, you know, such a task to, to do that for honeybees as well. So that's my, my ideas for limiting honeybees in urban areas. Great. Thank you so much, Kit, and great presentation. Great way to start off the day.